Well, here we go. Um, you know, of course, it gets really windy. Uh, I think this is hopefully my last online recorded lecture, and hopefully it's yours too. Maybe, maybe you have a couple more. Um, but it's been a tough year, and uh, you're in a few months actually. Um, thanks for hanging in there. Uh, we're almost done. Um, so today we're going to talk about. Um, let's see. Switch to the camera. No. Switch to the camera. There we go. Uh, today we're going to talk about clutches and brakes. Um, it, and you know, when I was in college, everybody knew what a clutch is because everybody drove a manual transmission car, right? Everybody drove a stick. Um, I'd be curious to know how many of you actually uh, drive a manual or know how to drive a manual, have driven a manual, maybe a tractor, old tractor. Um, but a, but a clutch, basically, if, if you have something that's spinning all the time, right? Say the engine in your car and uh, something that's not spinning all the time, such as the wheels. I'm sitting at a stoplight or a stop sign, or I'm waiting for my friend you know, to say goodbye to their parents so that we can drive home or wherever, right? The, the engine's spinning, the wheels are not. Somehow I have to engage these wheels so I can slowly start the wheels turning too and then you know, make my way towards uh, wherever I'm trying to go. Um, or, uh, you know, whatever, right? But this is the most common example is the engine is turning, but the wheels aren't, and somehow I have to engage these slowly and, slowly and smoothly. Once I get to where I'm going, I want to stop slowly and smoothly. So uh, I need to take these wheels that are spinning and push on them and, and, and transmit some torque between the spinning wheel, let's see, the spinning wheel and the, and the frame of my car somehow that's not spinning and then slow the wheels from spinning so that we can stop and safely get out of the car. Although sometimes we could jump out of the car when it's still moving. So those are clutches and brakes. Um, pretty common things, uh, not just automotive, but uh, lots and lots of machinery involves clutches and brakes. So we're going to take a closer look. All right, so back to this. Um, and first of all, I got this wrong right off the bat. This is not ball bearing nomenclature. This is just about clutches and brakes. We've talked about this. Uh, clutches um, permit smooth connection and disconnection so torque may be transmitted between two rotating shafts with a common axis, right? I can't turn a corner with a clutch. Um, typically they have common axes. Brakes, all right, permit smooth connection and disconnection so that torque may be transmitted between a rotating shaft and a fixed shaft. Right, the key thing there is it's fixed. Um, hence, the one thing that was rotating will now stop rotating, all right? Now, there's a bunch of ways to do this, types of transmission. Um, <clears throat> friction is the most common, right? Brakes, most brakes, well, I shouldn't even say that anymore. Uh, your bicycle probably has friction brakes. Um, it's cheap, it's common, it's easy, easily replaceable, right? Uh, so that means just, you know, some asbestos pad is rubbing on some metal disc and it slows things down. Uh, and then, or it speeds things up in the case of a clutch. Uh, hydrodynamic, right, this guy here. Um, if you look at a lot of cars, you know, high-end, like European luxury cars, um, they actually use a hydrodynamic torque converter. Um, and four-wheel drive trucks, tractors, oftentimes have this kind of stuff, hydraulic motors, uh, where I use fluids to transmit torque. Now, uh, this is one of my favorite lectures to talk about these because it's pretty cool. Um, it doesn't require any viscosity. It just requires a fluid that can flow and has mass. So it's kind of a neat fluids meets, you know, machines kind of thing. Um, and now these are getting to be much more common. Magnetic or eddy current brakes. Why is this? Um, because when we, you know, use a bunch of gasoline or energy to accelerate our Prius or our ID4 or whatever your, your Chevy Bolt or your Chevy Volt, whatever, um, you want to save that energy when you brake. And so non-contact magnetic and eddy current brakes are becoming more and more common. Um, so, uh, how do we design these things? Uh, there must be some force, right? I have to push something against something else. Well, well, I should clarify. We're gonna look at primarily friction in here, and we'll look at that. Um, there must be some force pushing two things together to create friction, right? Friction relies on some force. Now, friction, right, this is a classic entropy generator, right? And entropy generation typically results in heat. We have to get rid of that. Uh, and then whenever we have two surfaces rubbing on each other, right, uh, wear results and eventually they wear away and they disappear, so we have to plan for that. So there's a lot of things we need to consider um, regarding that. 
Now, here is the, uh, the automotive clutch, kind of a typical looking automotive clutch, and, and this is hard to describe. Um, but basically, this is the flywheel here, and this thing is always turning. This is always turning, right? But this goes to, let's just say this goes to the wheels, right? Uh, the wheels are not always turning. Sometimes I stop, sometimes I go. Uh, so what do we do, right? Well, the key thing is here, there's a big spring, and this big spring provides force, right? Because it's compressed, and it compresses this pressure plate or the friction plate uh, onto uh, the turning thing, right? So the light blue part might not be turning. So this is sometimes, sometimes turning uh, and sometimes not. And so I can engage and disengage this thing, right? So I can push on something, sometimes the, the, the clutch pedal in your car or maybe the clutch lever on a motorcycle or whatever, and disengage this so they're no longer touching. If they're not touching, there's no force, there's no force, there's no friction, no friction, no torque, right? Uh, and so I can engage in this thing, engage and disengage slowly and in a controlled manner. Um, but like I said here, you know, as we move towards primarily electric cars, uh, this thing's going to be kind of a dinosaur, as am I. Okay, so here's our basic clutch disc, uh, a much easier picture to look at. Right, so this is uh, always, always got some omega, and this is sometimes, right? And when those two uh, press on each other, um, they, they drag on each other, right? Some dimensions, we have some, oftentimes it's a ring. Let's see if this one's a ring. Yeah, that's a ring, because it's got a bunch of, you know, spline in the middle, right? So there's some stuff in the middle that we have to work around. Uh, and so there's stuff in here. Uh, we have an inner radius that goes there. We have an outer radius that goes out to there. Oh, look at this. That's a little preview of some coming attractions. We have some differential radius there, a ring element, a differential element ring uh, subjected to some P. Right, let's take a quick, let's talk about P. <laughs> no, we're not going to talk about urine, although that is an interesting fluid mechanics problem. Um, Pressure. What is pressure? It's force divided by some area. A force spread over a small area is high pressure. Big area, well, not much pressure, right? The smaller the area gets, the higher the pressure becomes for a given force. All right, so I know you're saying, Tressler, we've known this for years. Eh, reminder, reminder. Uh, and then the next thing is torque is force times the distance. The farther I get away from you know, the center, the more torque I get, right? This is gonna become important, so let's remember that. Now let's go back to that. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So in designing a clutch, you need to predict the transmission torque, right, because that's what I'm trying to do. Um, eventually they don't slip, so the speed is constant, so transmitting torque is the key thing. For a given actuation force. So the torque, remember, is, you know, like in this direction, and the force is up here. Right, that's the squeezes them together, and the torque is what you know, provides the power to the wheels or whatever, right? Or whatever equipment I'm trying to power. Okay, um, this is important. All right, uh, a new versus a worn clutch. We're talking about clutches first here. Uh, so with a new clutch, right, we have this nice square plate. And let's draw a nice square plate here. So the the I'll zoom in here. It's nice and new. And typically, it's made out of some asbestos material. Oh, that's too big there. I don't want that. Let's try that. Some asbestos material, something like that, right? Um, that, that can handle heat pretty well. Uh, and so it's nice and flat, right? But after I've driven, you know, 10, 15, 50,000 miles, um, you know, and eventually my Volkswagen bus can't make it up the hill anymore, but eventually it starts to look like this. Right, why does it start to look like that? Right, so this is zoomed in here. So this is like that. Um, why? Because the wear is proportional to velocity, right? The velocity is higher at the outside, right? So this has got a high V, not the grocery store, high velocity. And in here, it's got a low velocity, right? Low V. 
And so the higher velocity is where it wears down more, right? So the resulting effect of this is this is gonna have some high pressure there and some low pressure there as I squeeze it together, right? Because think of this as a spring. Uh, let's go back to the red one here. If I think of this as a spring, right, that's gonna compress more. It's the same material, same Young's modulus, so that's gonna compress more to engage this whole thing, so it's gonna have higher pressure, sure. Okay, um, so what happens there, the relationship between torque and uh, friction, uh, or torque and force is different for these two things. All right, so, oh uh, yeah, here we go. Nomenclature, F. This is the ax axial force here. This is the force that pushes the two plates together. Big T is the transmission torque. That's how much torque I'm trying to transmit. Pressure is the, you know, the, the pressure, the force divided by the total area, right? And then we have inner radius and outer radius. Okay, just so we're sure on that. Now, we reviewed this already, but force is area times pressure, right? Area times pressure. Now I feel like I have to erase that because I, I kind of screwed that up. Um, it's still area times pressure, but this right here is the area, right? 2 pi r dr, right? How does that work? Um, yeah, so the circumference is 2 pi r, and then the width of it is dr, so the circumference, so the, you know, I stretch this thing out into one strip, and then that's the area, that's a differential area, um, and then the p is the pressure. Okay, so the differential force is the um, differential area times the pressure at that area. All right, now we integrate this. We're going to add up all these little forces here. We're going to add up all the little forces, add them up with the integral. So we're going to integrate from the inner radius to the outer radius of the, uh, let's see, 2 pi r dr times p. Yeah, so this is just the same thing rearranged. If I integrate all that, I wind up with this. Okay, so the force is the pressure times pi r squared. Oh yeah, we knew that, because this is just pi r squared or pi outer squared minus inner squared. All right, so no, nothing really to revelation there. Um, but uh, force is pressure times area, and area is pi r squared. All right, but I'm not interested in force, right? What I'm trying to do is transmit torque. So torque is the force, right? And that, remember force, this is the axial force here times the friction times the radius, right? So this is, we gotta remember this is axial force. The squeezing force, not the tangential force. So it's the force times the friction. That gives us a tangential force. So I'll do that in blue. This thing here is the tangential force. Tangential, right, whatever. Okay. So the tangential force times the radius, that gives me some torque, okay? So uh, let's figure out how to do that with a little calculus. So I've got some differential torque is some differential area, right? Times the pressure times the coefficient of friction times the radius, right? So it's an area times a pressure, which is a differential normal force times the friction gives me tangential force times the radius gives me torque, all right? And so I can rearrange that so it makes a nicer integral here. So it's a two pi pressure times coefficient of friction times the radius squared, right, dr, right? And I integrate that stuff and I get something that looks like this, raise the power, divide by the new power, blah, 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 blah. So now the torque I'm transmitting becomes two thirds times pi times the pressure, pressure, what the hell is the pressure again? Oh yeah, that's the force over the area, right? So this is pressure which is constant. Why is that constant? Let's go back here. Oh yeah, so when it's new, it's uniform pressure, which means the pressure is constant everywhere along that disk. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. So the pressure is constant times the coefficient of friction, we'll say that's constant, um, and then times the radius cubed minus the inner radius cubed. Okay, that kind of makes sense, but let's keep going. And then if we have a bunch of friction interfaces, you know, like, uh, in this picture here, we actually have two friction interfaces there, if you look really closely, but let's not worry about that too much. Um, so we have two, you know, two interfaces here, uh, or some, 
and then we can get the total torque, right? But what am I trying to do again? I totally forgot what I'm trying to do. Oh, I'm trying to relate torque to the axial force. When I push axially on this clutch plate, how much torque do I get? So I'm kind of turning a corner with my mathematics. Um, so I, I look at this, and so now I substitute what is the pressure. So I go back up here to equation A, right? So this pressure comes from up there. So if I solve for pressure, right, I get, what do I get? I get uh, force over uh, pi times r squared minus r squared. Okay, so now I get this, and that gets a red box. This is an important equation that gets a red box. All right. Let's see if this makes sense. Hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop for a second. Camera, other camera. Does this make sense? The reason I like this topic so much is <clears throat> because it forces us to kind of go through the mathematics. And if we're confident that we did the mathematics correctly, we should get an equation that makes sense. <clears throat> um, engineers don't plug numbers into equations. Engineers solve problems. And to solve a problem, you have to understand fundamentally where does this equation come from? What pieces, what ingredients, what techniques and methods did we use to get this equation? Uh, only then, you know, can, can we really solve problems, right? If you just want to plug numbers into an equation, well, there's software that does that, right? Thousand bucks, fifteen hundred bucks, I can get a copy of these um, and never need to plug an equation in again, right? Uh, if I'm going to pay you $80,000 a year, you better do something other than plug numbers into an equation. All right, so let's take a look. Does this equation make sense? All right, does it make sense? So here I've got some clutch. Right? It's got an inner radius and outer radius. I've got some force. Let's see, if I increase the force that I squeeze these things together with, I'll get an increase in torque. All right, yeah, I'm cool with that. If I increase the friction... Right? I'll get more torque. Yeah, that makes sense too, right? If I increase the outer radius, right, so I make this bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, yeah, that, let's see, that, that number gets bigger inside the parentheses, so yeah, sure, I get more torque. Minus the inner radius, what does that mean? What does that mean? So I want to make the top bigger to get more torque, so I have to subtract um, an inner radius there. So the smaller my inner radius is, uh, so a smaller, if I make the intermediate smaller, I'm subtracting a smaller number, so that's bigger. Yeah, so that even makes sense, right? I'm not subtracting as much. Don't subtract much, All right? So if I don't subtract much from, from the total area, then uh, I'll, I'll get more torque. All right, and then, of course, the, the more plates I have, the, the more torque I can transmit, right? Now, uh, when I solve for P, I wound up with an R squared minus R squared. So this is interesting because now I, I want this number to be as small as I can, which means I want to subtract as much as I can. But the R cubed terms on top dominate the R squared terms on bottom. If we were to like expand this and kind of simplify it, right, you'd wind up with just an R. Um, so yeah, this equation makes sense. I'm pretty sure we did the math correctly. I hope we did the math correctly. So this makes sense. We have, you know, a pressure plate that's nice and square. And, you know, the, the bigger it gets on this direction, the smaller it gets in this direction. The more surface area I have, um, the more pressure I get, or the more torque I get, right? Um, yeah, okay. So let's go back to the notes here. All right, this makes sense. Okay, so let's go to a worn clutch, uniform wear. Uh, okay, so wear is proportional to proportional to pressure and velocity, right? Velocity is proportional to radius. So as I go far away, this is increasing R, uh, I'm going to have more material here, more material, and then this is less material or less material up there, which means I'm going to have a higher pressure here. And then I'm going to have lower pressure out here. Huh, all right, so um, I guess that means that, uh, you know, smaller radius, bigger pressure, you know, down here, smaller radius, bigger pressure, 
bigger radius, smaller pressure, perhaps pressure times radius is a constant. So this is P times R is a constant. So everywhere I look on this thing, pressure and radius, the, the product of pressure and radius is the same, right? So if I want to figure out what this is, I can pick it anywhere. So I'm going to pick it at, this is just a convenient place. Right? If my pressure and my radius are, are con the pressure times my radius are constant, I'm just going to pick maximum pressure should result at my inner radius. So I'm just going to call that number a constant. Okay? And that will show up here. So uh, what is my force? Right? It is my area, 2 pi, let's see this here, I'll do this in green. My um, area is 2 pi r dr. And then I multiply that times a uh, pressure, and that gives me a force, right? So I find that's my integrated force. Uh, and when I go through and do this integration, uh, I wind up with this here. All right, so the force. Oh, now this is a little different. This is a little different, right? It's 2 pi times the maximum pressure times the inner radius. Remember, this is a constant times R O minus R I. Right, so my force kind of varies uh, as I move around in here, and it, um, uh, you know, the things are changing, so things are a little bit trickier. That's okay, this is correct. This, I'm sure, is correct. So now, uh, let's do the uh, differential torque element, right? I'm not interested in, in uh, force, I'm interested in torque. So it's uh, 2 pi r i dr, right? Why is that 2 pi r dr? Because that's my innermost ring, right? So this is my innermost ring uh, times the friction times the radius, right? And so now if I integrate that, this r i goes to here. This r goes to here. And that r, remember this is a constant. And that's my variable of integration. That's my dr there, right? Um, so now I go through and integrate this thing. Uh, and so now I've got the torque is pi times my max pressure uh, times my inner radius times uh, friction times the r o squared minus r i squared. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to do the same thing. I want to get my p max, right? What is p max? I'm not interested in pressure. I'm interested in force. So I go back up here and solve uh, up here. So I take this P max and I plug that in down there and I get this equation here. All right, so that's another one that gets a red box. Da, 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 da. Okay, so torque. I increase my force. I'm gonna do these in green. Just because I feel like changing colors. All right, I increase my force. Does that increase my torque? Yeah, that makes sense. I increase my coefficient of friction. Does that increase my torque? Of course, that makes sense too. All right, okay. I increase my outer radius, all right? What am I effectively doing there? I'm, I'm making my, you know, I'm making my clutch bigger. Yeah, I increase my force. Wait a minute. I increase my inner radius. What? So if I increase my inner radius, so now I'm going like this, what? Uh, so by make, increasing the radius, I'm, in, I'm, I'm basically taking a frisbee and making it into an aerobee, uh, and I get more torque. That doesn't make sense. What the hell is going on here? So this is where you don't trust the math, right? You, you should trust the math. The math is right. Math works. I taught math for many years. I wouldn't have done that if it didn't work. The math works. But when the math gives you some results that are counterintuitive, you, then you gotta scratch your head a little bit and say, hmm, why is that? So let's scratch our head a little bit and think about that, right? Okay, so something here doesn't make sense. All right, so maybe something on the next slide. No, oh, no, the next slide doesn't give me much to work with. Oops, I don't do that. What, what, all right. Let's remember, let's, I got this huge, uh, there's a way to adjust the thickness here. Oh, that is pretty thin. Okay, good. Um, so remember that most of my pressure, this is what my worn disc looks like, right? So this is the worn, the, the, 
palm cancellation isn't working on here as well. Worn plate. Right, it looks like this. So this has high pressure. And this has low pressure. Right? Well, uh, so what does that mean? If I've got a lot of pressure there, I've got a high, so if there's a lot of pressure over this, you know, times this differential area there, that gives me a high F tan, right? Uh, and out here, I've got a low F tan. Now, I'm going to try to explain this. Let's see if we can do it. So I've only got so much pressure. I've only got so much axial pressure. You know, like if, I, if I'm working the clutch in my car, uh, actually, I, I no longer own a car with a manual transmission. It kind of sucks. Um, anyway, in my old Volkswagen Golf, right, and had a clutch. Uh, so I push on the clutch. My leg is only so strong, so I've only go, got so much axial force, right? If I'm gonna, if, if you know, so, and say the pressure plate goes like this, it's really tall towards the center and it gets worn Oh, it's worn away towards the towards the um, outer radius. So, if I've only got so much pressure, and I've focused, or um, excuse me, big difference, big difference. I've only got, got so much force to use, and if I use up all that force on these big piles of you know clutch material that remains, let's take a look at that. Let's take a look. Oh, look at that! I'm using all of my force to compress this area here. But look at this radius. Little bitty radius. Little bitty radius there, right? So I'm going to use up all my force and generate all my pressure right there near the center of the clutch plate. Torque equals force times radius, right? If I've got a little radius, I'm not transmitting much torque. So I'm using up all my axial force to not generate much torque, and that kind of sucks. All right, let's go back here. Oh, so sure, sure. So if I've got, um, you know, so, so if I've got a big inner radius, that actually helps me. Why is that? Because this, so I, I use up all my pressure in this little area here. That's got all my force gets used up there where it doesn't generate much torque. This works out a lot better. Right, because now I'm using all my pressure out here far, far away from the center axis uh, where it does generate a lot of torque. All right, so this is a great example of where the equation doesn't make sense when you first look at it, but you dig a little deeper, and yes, it does. Really, really important. Okay, um, clutches uh, summary, right? Um, for a new clutch, looks like this, right? I want a big outer radius and a little inner radius, and that gives me a lot of torque. But when it starts to wear away, it looks like this, right? Where the inner radius, I, 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 the inner radius doesn't do me much good, right? So I want to focus all my force, all my pressure, and then all my friction towards the outside, right? I want to get it out away from the central axis. Um, so that's that. Right now, um, the, uh, you know, I get a lot of torque here. Right, this is great. Lots of torque. Lots of torque. Right, but that doesn't last long. Right, pretty soon you don't have the fancy new Porsche with a new clutch. You've got an old Volkswagen Golf with an old worn out clutch or an old VW bus. Can't make it up the hill. Right, so when, when you're designing these things, uh, design on the, the worn, you know, you design it for the clutch wearing down. Right, now it turns out, right, that the ideal radius is this, and you're gonna do a homework problem. Your one and only, well, no. One of, the, the only homework problem that I'm gonna write is gonna be for you to figure out why that is. All right, so that's the best. And look, that square root of three shows up everywhere, man. Square root of three pi and the square root of three, they're all over the place. Um, and so typically, we'll, you know, the, the proportions of, of clutches will look something like that. Um, okay, so uh, this is getting too long. And so, um, oh yeah, so here we've got some stuff about torques. If, if I need more torque from a more compact clutch, I can just add more friction faces, right? Here I just have one, right? One um, friction surface, right? Where this is, uh, you know, like the, the clutch pushes on the flywheel or something like that. Uh, here I've got a couple, 
right? Uh, here I've got, let's see, one, two, three, four plates, but I only get three surfaces because I only got one, two, three surfaces there. That's interesting. Um, here I've got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, and that gives me four surfaces. All right, so um, a lot of big trucks, tractors, and stuff like that that transmit a lot of torque uh, will frequently have um, many, many um, surf pressure plates uh, within their torque. So anyway, I was going to talk about braking. Um, but this is getting too long. Maybe I'll do that. Uh, yeah, I'll do an example. This will be your other, <laughs> your other homework problem. I'll have you guys do this one. Um, but it's on the order of, so, so if I'm, uh, you know, I weigh 108 kilograms, you know, 100 kilograms for me, eight kilograms for my bike. Uh, let's say I'm going 25 miles an hour, that fast. Um, if I'm gonna come to a stop in two seconds, uh, what did this work out to be? This worked out to be, um, I mean, this is a thermal problem, but it's about 2.5 kilowatts, right? So a lot of energy, a lot of kinetic energy is getting converted into heat very quickly uh, when I stop my bike. Um, now a car, right? So this is 108 kilograms, 220 pounds. A car is easily 10 times that, right? Um, car equals 10x. Right? And the speeds, 25 miles an hour, let's say, you know, now that people driving around 75, speed is 3x, right? But let's see, kinetic energy equals 1 half mv squared. So it's uh, times 10 times 9 equals 90 times, right? So the, the amount of energy that I need to dissipate from the brakes to stop from 75 miles an hour down to zero in two seconds, right, is 90 times, so 1,800 kilowatts. Now it's even more than 18, uh, 23, 230? Yeah, 230 kilowatts, right? That's an enormous amount of power generated by those brakes in the form of heat, right? So we gotta keep brakes cool. Uh, but how do brakes work? Right, well, oh, this is a familiar looking drawing here. We've seen this before. Um, the only difference is that I've got a rotor that looks like this and my brake shoe that presses on the rotor is only like that big, right? So this is the rotor, right? A couple reasons for that is, A, it's easier to assemble that way. B, so power heat here Right, because that's going to get really hot where the, the pad is actually rubbing on the um, rotor. Uh, and then this all becomes cooling. Right, and we try to push as much air over those spots as possible or, or push air, you know, inside of, of the brake rotor, right? Um, so the equation looks very, very similar. It's the Warren, um, the Warren clutch equation, uh, except we adjust it for... Um, how much, uh, how big the brake shoe is, right? Because this brake shoe is only on the order of, I don't know, 75 degrees, 80 degrees maybe. Um, degrees like of a circle and not degrees of temperature. Uh, so we just have to adjust those. Uh, and I think that's all I'm gonna do. Yeah, that's all I'm gonna do today. Um, I did wanna do drum brakes, but I don't think we're gonna get to drum drape brakes. I mean, the geometry and the calculus becomes really cool because you integrate like sines and cosines and stuff like that, but um, I think we're gonna skip that. So, uh, that being said, um, that's it. This is my, that's my last, last video lecture. Uh, I hope somebody comes to drop in lecture. And um, yeah, it's been tough. Uh, for those of you seniors, I hope you enjoy next, uh, ho hopefully no, none of you are graduating, right? Cause that would kind of suck to graduate in a pandemic. Next fall, uh, we'll see you at the terrace. We'll do something fun. Um, hang in there, we're almost done. Talk to you soon.